Last week was my birthday. Thank you. I didn't say that to get a, a cheap applause. I said it because my wife said, I, we can eat anywhere you want. And of course, if she gives me an open invitation to eat wherever I want, I want a good, juicy steak. Sorry to you vegetarian brothers and sisters. I want a big, juicy steak. And so we went to a steakhouse and I said, I want the biggest steak on the menu. I want the biggest, I want the biggest steak there is. And so they said, okay. And they took my order and they turned to my wife and my wife says, I think I'm going to have the fish. And I said, you don't go to a steakhouse to order a fish. That, that just, this doesn't make sense to me. I mean, who are you? But she says, I want fish. I want to try the fish. I heard this fish is good and I want to try it. So she, she, you know, orders the fish and I go, okay. So I get the steak and she gets fish and I'm eating my steak and I'm looking over at my wife and my wife is having like this religious experience with this fish. She's like, this is so good. This is so good. This is so good. This is so good. And I'm like, my, my steak is better. And she's like, no, no, no. This is so good. This is so good. And so finally I looked at her and I said, is it really, really, really that good? Is it really that good? And she said, yeah, you got to taste it. So I tasted it and I was like, this is really, really good. This is really good. This is really good. But when I heard fish at a steakhouse, I made the assumption it's not going to be good. Can I talk to you a little bit about grace? I just pulled a switch on you, didn't I? I think when most of us hear the word grace, we think of fish at a steakhouse. It just seems boring. But what I want to do to you and do for you is I want to open up a buffet of grace. Who's ready to feast on grace this weekend? Come on. I need you to help me preach. Who's ready to feast on grace? The land, Deltona, Orange City, online. So I want to serve some grace. And I want to show you because I know you're going to be questioning, is it really, really, really that good? And I'm going to answer yes. It's really that good. Grace is better than you could ever imagine. And so what I want to do is I want to begin to unpack this idea of grace for you that you can taste and see the goodness of God. In Exodus 34, verse six is going to be our launching point. God is, has appeared to Moses and he's going to introduce who he is. This is God from eternity, existed from eternity. At this point in history, he shows up to introduce himself. That's a big deal. This is a first date type of experience. So God shows up and says, here's who I am. I am the Lord, Yahweh, I am. I am the Lord, Yahweh, I am. Who are you, God? He says, I am compassionate. I am gracious. I am slow to anger. And I am abounding in faithful, good love. And I am always, always faithful. When God says, when I want to introduce myself, the first two words that I'm going to use are the word compassion and then our word that we're going to hone in on, this word, gracious. Turn to somebody and say, God is gracious. But what does that mean? The, the word gracious in the Hebrew is the word chahun, chanun. So go ahead and say it, chanun, chanun. Yeah, you got to get that little guttural back again. This is Hebrew, chanun, chanun. And, and most of the time when we think of grace, and this is where I think we just think like, mm, grace, when we think of grace, we think of God having this disposition, this goodness, you know, that when God thinks about you, he's like full of good thoughts. He's a good God and he's like thinking good things about you. But when the Bible actually talks about grace, it doesn't talk about a feeling. It doesn't talk about a mentality. It actually talks about an action. When, when we talk about grace, what we begin to begin to discover as you study through the Hebrew scripture and into the New Testament is that grace is God's goodness. God is good, and is his goodness actually in action. So God is not just in a good mood. That's good. But God is in such a good mood that he actually moves towards moving with goodness in everything that he does. This means that when we are in Christ Jesus, we don't have to earn God's goodness. We have already received God's goodness. I don't have to earn God's favor. I already live in favor. I live in favor right now because all the favor of God is poured out on me and through me and in me through Jesus Christ. Grace is God moving to make sure that happens in your life and in my life. That's the goodness of grace. And so when the scriptures talks about this whole idea of grace, it's an action. It's a response. It's God moving in the midst of our world, in the midst of our lives. And so grace means that God makes a deliberate decision. You see, God decided to be gracious to you. 
And the reason he had to decide to be gracious to you is because you didn't deserve his goodness. That's why it's called grace. If you deserved it, it wouldn't be grace. But God gives you what you don't deserve because that's how good he is. He gives you over and beyond what you could ever imagine because his goodness wants to be put into action and his his goodness moves through grace. And so what I began to do is I thought about this message. I went through the whole entire Bible and I, I, I began to discover how does God move with grace? How does he move with goodness? And what I found are three kind of incredible points that really come out that show us how God moves in action to move with grace and move with goodness. And so I'm, I want to share these things because I had a good time studying the word of God. I hope you study the word of God because the word of God is so powerful. I enjoy it. I can't believe I get paid to study the word of God. And then I get the opportunity to share with you what God taught me. And so I want to show you what God began to reveal as I studied the whole word of God from Genesis to Revelation. How does God move with goodness? And why is that called grace? The first thing that I began to find as I studied the word of God, if you're taking notes, write this down. God's grace directs your steps. What what you find is that God's goodness is his presence that actually wants to guide you in life. You, You see, the God we serve is not a God who's just distant. The God we serve is not a deist who kind of spun the world into existence on the sixth day and said, I'm done. He's actually a God who wants to involve himself in the everyday realities of what we deal with. He's a God who wants to guide our every step. And this is important. And this is why it's so important that it's called grace and why God has to do it. Because Proverbs 14 gives us a little insight into our struggle. My struggle, your struggle, everybody's struggle. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that appears to be right. There's going to be times when you're going to look at something and believe it's the right thing to do. There's going to be times in your life where you look at it and you go, well, I believe this is right. I think this is right. This feels right. And you use all your imagination, all your feeling, all your creativity, all your wisdom. You put everything into it. And in the moment, it appears right to you. But then listen to the reality. But in the end, it leads to what? Death. This is an insight into how messed up we are, how fallen we are because of sin. That we can believe something in the moment is right, think it's right, feel it's right, but in the end, if we follow down that path, it's going to lead us into where? Death. I mean, come on. We know this. We know this to be true. Because how many times in your life did you say, what could go wrong? Ooh, a lot. And something we say a lot at Journey Church is, where has you leading you, gotten you in life? Not good places. Left of my own imagination, left of my own will, left of my own wisdom, left of my own power, left of my own understanding, I'm going to constantly make decisions that hurt me and hurt the people that love me. So what does God do? This is his grace. Psalm 24 or Psalm 25, verse eight. For the Lord is good and does what is right. How does God prove he's good and prove he is right? For he shows the proper path to those who go astray. How does God show his goodness? He says, I know where you're going to head to by you leading you. So I'm going to guide you in the personal places where you need to be, the places that are going to bless you and prosper you in all that you do. So Isaiah 48, 17 says, this is what the Lord says. Your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you. God knows what's best for you. Just turn to somebody and let them know that. God knows what's best for you. So because he knows what's best for you, He directs you in the way that you should go. Do do you see how this is grace? Left to you, you're going to look at a thing and you're going to say, "Mm, this is the right way to go. But if you follow that path, it's going to end up where? Death. So God says, I love you too much to allow you to lead you because you leading you is going to end up in destruction. So I'm going to give you some principles. I'm going to actually personally begin to lead you to the place you need to go because I know what's best for you. So therefore, I want to direct you. That's grace. You see, you don't deserve that, right? You and I deserve for God to say, well, you do what you want to do. You be you. 
And you being you ends up in a lot of hurt. You being you ends up in broken marriages, addiction, struggles, prison, debt. Come on. You being you has not ended up being good for you. And so God says, I know what's best for you. I want to direct you to the good places. And so God comes along. He says, I want to lead you there. Psalm 116, verse five. For the Lord is, and there's our word, gracious. The Lord is gracious and he is righteous. Our God is full of compassion. For the Lord protects. How does the Lord protect? This is so beautiful. How does God protect you? For you, Lord, have delivered, literally means directed me. You have directed me from death. God, if I would have kept following that path, I would have ended up dead. Man, when I look over my life, I was talking to a group of friends this week, and I was thinking about this message. And I said, if it wasn't for the guidance of God, I know where I would be. I would be divorced. I would be in prison. I would be an addict or I'd be dead. That's where I'd be. You see, God does what I cannot do. He directs me because I know I'm going to be constantly fooling myself into making stupid decisions that hurt me. So God says, I want to direct you. And as he directs you, he's going to deliver me from death and my eyes from tears. How many things have God kept you from that you wouldn't be crying? That you'd be crying right now if God didn't intervene and guide you away from? You know what? I, whew, come on. How many things would you be crying over this weekend that you'd be crying over right now if God didn't step in and say, no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm going to fight you every way down that path. And God stood in your way and stood in your way and stood in your way and stood in your way. And somehow you came to a common sense. Ooh, God might be trying to speak to me. Stay away from that. And you said, God, I'm going to follow you instead of following me. And you're not crying tears this weekend because God stepped in and God says, I'll direct you to good places. That's the grace of God. He kept my eyes from tears and kept my feet from stumbling so that I love this so that so that the aim of my life is that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living you see God recognizes your limitations before you ever step into the environments you're about to step into God already knows your limitations And he knows what would happen if you entered into that area. So he purposely tries to direct you away from the very thing that you're heading into because he wants to bless you by already preparing the step that he has for you. That's his goodness. So we can say in Psalm 32, verse eight, so I will instruct you and I will teach you in the way that you should go, God says. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. God looks at you and says, I know you don't deserve it, but here's what I want you to know. No matter where you're at and no matter what you're going through, my loving eye is always on you. I mean, that's good to know at times when I feel like I'm at the bottom of the ocean. That's good to know at times where I feel like no one cares for me. It's good to know when I feel like I'm about to give up. It's good to know when I feel like I'm getting struggling. I'm at my wits end and I can't do it. And I remind myself, hold on, the loving eye of God is upon me. He's watching over me. He's watching me with his loving eye. He wants to guide me to the better place. So we can say, as David says in Psalm 73, verse 23, he says, David says, Lord, I'm always with you. There's never been a time that I've never been with you. I'm always with you. And when I have struggled, you have held me. You've held me by my right hand. When I didn't know what to do, I reached out and God, you always led me. So you always guide me. And so he enters in and he makes this statement. You see how personal this is for David? So you guide me with your counsel. God, you've given me your word. And so God, by your word, I I digest your word. I I live by your word. I read your word. This is why it's so important to get into scripture on a constant basis because the word of God comes alive when you read the scriptures. And so God, you've held me and you've guided me with your counsel. And afterwards, you're gonna take me on to glory. So God, you know my limitations. You know where I need to end up. And so God, I'm holding on to you because you're holding on to me and you're gonna direct me to the very place that I need to be in order to experience the blessing that you have for me. But it takes a decision in order to be guided, right? It takes a decision. Proverbs 3, 5 says, so trust in the Lord. Here's your part. 
God wants to lead you. So what's your response? Trust in the Lord. God wants to lead you. What's your response? Trust in the Lord. I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep going at this. Come on, Delane, you better be loud. God, I, you're going to lead me. So here's my response. I'm going to trust in the Lord. I'm going to trust in the Lord with all my heart. I'm not going to lean not, lean not, lean not, lean not, lean not, lean not. Push somebody, say lean not on your own understanding. But in all your ways, turn to your other neighbor, say all your ways. That means your financial ways, your single ways, your parenting ways, your love ways, your relational ways, your work ways, all your ways. I've come to a point in my life where I realize when I lead me, I lead myself to destruction. Have you come to a point where you realize that? Because if not, you're going to keep heading into brokenness wondering how in the world did I get there? Here's how you got there. You led yourself there. And you can blame it on everybody you want to. You can blame it and blame it and blame it and you can blame it on him. But who brought him into your house in the first place? You can blame it on her, blame it on her. But who chased her in the first place? It was you. So don't be blaming it on everybody else. You had a part in this. And so he says, I, I'm not going to lean on my own understanding, but in all your ways, submit, surrender to him. And he will. I love this word. Not he might. Because there's times when my decisions lead me to places that look impossible to get out of. You ever been there? <laughs> you ever spent more in the week than you make in the week? You, you, come on, we're, we can be honest at Journey Church. We don't pretend here. There's been times I've placed myself in situations where it seemed too big. But as soon as I reach out to him and begin to trust in him and tell him to lead me and surrender to his will, he will, not he might, he will, he will, he will. He will make my path straight. So that means if I'm in the middle of it and I'm struggling, God, I'm trusting in you. I don't know a way to get out of here, but I trust by your grace you want to bring me. So you have made a decision that you're going to lead me because you already know my limitations. You already know that I'd be a single mom trying to get out of this mess. You already know I'd be struggling with this addiction. You already know I'd be messing with this temptation again that I said I would never mess with. So God, I'm trusting in you. I'm leaning not. I'm leaning not in my own understanding, but in all my ways, I'm holding on to your hand because I'm believing you will make the path straight. And every time you place God in the middle of your decisions, God works in the middle of every decision you make. That's the goodness of God. That's his grace. That's his grace. You don't deserve it. And so we can say, as Jeremiah 29, 11 says, here's how we know. Where God says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you. One thing I try to do every single week is try to get you to see that God's trying to prosper you and not to harm you. That's how good he is. Plans to give you hope and a future. God says, this is where I want to lead you. I want to lead you to hope and I want to lead you to future. I want to lead you to good places. So he personally guides your steps. That's the grace of God. But here's my problem. And this is where I began to study and something else began to come out in the scriptures that I studied about God's grace. Is that God at times will lead me down paths and tell me things to do, but I will not have the ability to do it. In my own power. And what we began to find, and as you read through scripture, what you begin to find is not only does God guide you, but God's grace also empowers your life. See, see, if all God did was point you down the road, say, hey, you need to walk down this road left in your own power, you could never walk down the right road God is placing you on. I need God to empower me to do what I can't do. I need God to empower me to follow him in the ways that I should follow him. I need God to begin to move with power to take me to the very place he wants to bring me. See, if God didn't show us the path once he shows it to us, if he didn't give us the power to do it, we would just end up stuck. But we're not stuck. We have the grace of God empowering our life. I want to show you this. Psalm 73. You guide me with your counsel. So God, you guide me. And what God guides you towards, he'll empower you to do. 
Can, can, can I share this with you? Whatever God has called you to do, he will empower you to do it. That's grace. Because here's why I say that. Listen to what David says. You guide me with your counsel, but my flesh and my heart may fail. God, I can't do what you're calling me to do. God, I'm struggling. I'm struggling. I need some strength, God. I need some strength to keep going when I want to give up. I need some strength because, God, this temptation is, feels overwhelming at this moment, and I want to give in. God, I need some strength to put up with these kids because right now they're on my last nerves. God, I need some strength to keep committed to this marriage because, God, I made a vow, but right now there's a lot of things that are pushing me to walk away from the vow that I just made. God, I need strength because my heart is failing. My flesh is failing. And David says, in that moment, I realize that my strength would fail, but my God, but God is the strength of my heart and he's my portion forever. God's not going to let me down. What he guides me towards, he's going to empower me to do. That's the grace of God. That's the goodness of God. He's moving and he's working. And he gives you, he gives you the strength. And so we say in Psalm 28, verse seven, for the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, for he helps me. That every time I trust in God, he gives me the strength that I need to do what he's called me to do. God knows you're limited. God, God knows that you don't have the ability to do it. And this is, what, this is what freaks you out. What causes you so much anxiety is that you worry about having the strength to do what you know you should do. And God says, if I called you to do it, I'll give you the strength to fulfill it. I will help you. Not because you deserve it, but because that's how good God is. He wants to help you. So Psalm 138, verse three. The psalmist writes, in the day when I cried out, when I was stuck in the mess, when I was struggling, when I was in debt, I cried out to the Lord, my God. I cried out to him. I said, I need help, God. I can't do this. And you answered me and you made me bold with strength in my soul. Sometimes God will, sometimes God will split the sea for you. And sometimes God will give you the strength to walk on the water that's in front of you. Sometimes God will take care of the enemies and sometimes God will give you the strength to deal with the enemies he's bringing towards you to show you that it's his strength and not your strength. And sometimes you need to realize how the grace of God works in your life because sometimes you've been praying for God to do a movement and because it didn't happen the way you expected it to happen, you think God failed you, but he didn't fail you. He actually gave you the strength to do it. That's the grace of God. It works out for good in the end. That's the grace of God. He gives you boldness at times for a strength within you. So great does, grace doesn't mean that you no longer have to give effort. No, 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 no. Grace doesn't mean that it doesn't matter how you live. You can live however you want to live. No, 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 no. Grace empowers you to live ways that please God. So Isaiah 40. It says he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength, renew their strength, renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. How do we know this? So he says, verse, chapter 41, verse 10, a couple verses later. So do not fear. Why? For God says, I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Grace is God's commitment. God's, God is committed to use all of his strength, all of his wisdom, all of his power, all of his might, all of his goodness to heal you, to redeem you, to restore you, to empower you, to live in the destiny you were created to live in. That's the grace of God, that I need the strength of God to do my destiny, what God has called me to do. And God says, when you rely upon me, I will fill you with my power so that you will never grow weary. You will never faint. You'll never be able to give up because my grace is sufficient for you. In your weakness, I will show you my very strength. That's the grace of God. So 2 Timothy 2.1 says for us, 
and says, so be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace. In order to get strong on something means you need to exercise it, right? Come on, they got quiet. The land, they got quiet here in OC because maybe they were thinking that to get strong, they didn't have to fulfill their New Year's resolution and actually show up to the gym to get strong. They thought they could sit on the couch and just eat bonbons and drink chocolate milk and think they'll grow strong. You don't go strong by sitting on the couch. <laughs> you don't lose weight going to the buffets. How do you do it? You got to grow strong. You got to put some work into it. We think grace is an absence of effort. Grace is not an absence of effort. It's an absolute absent of an attitude of trying to earn something. Grace is not about me just sitting there. Grace is about me fighting with everything within me for the power of God is strong. I'm not trying to earn something. I'm trying to rest in what's already been given me in Christ Jesus. So 1 Corinthians 10 or 15, it says, but God's amazing grace has made me who I am. He says, everything I am today is because of the grace of God. And his grace to me was not fruitless. In fact, I worked harder. I worked harder than all the rest. Yet, 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 yet not in my own strength, but God's strength. For his empowering grace is poured out upon me. Paul says, I am who I am today because of the grace of God. And I've worked hard, but it hasn't been me earning this. No, no, no. It's been me strengthening myself in the grace that is mine in Christ Jesus. I'm resting in his grace and I'm empowered by grace to fight the fight. And because the whole time it's God who strengthened me to do what he's called me to do. You see, it's an attitude. It's an attitude of saying, God, I can't, but I know you can. And so, yes, there's going to take a lot of effort. Yes, there's going to take a lot of effort. It's going to take effort to say no to the things that want to kill you. It's going to take effort to crucify the flesh. It's going to take effort to say yes to all the things that God has you. It's going to take effort. But grace is saying, but it's not my effort. It's the effort that as I push in, the strength of God pursues me and the strength of God overwhelms me. I'm not earning it. I'm receiving it. That's the beauty of grace. And so James 4, 6 says, he gives grace generously. I love this. He, he doesn't, he's not stingy with grace. He gives grace generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the who? 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 To the humble. You see, God can't give you power if you're holding on to your pride. God wants to empower you to do what he's called you to do, but what's keeping you from being empowered is you're holding on to pride thinking you can do it. And what God says to that is, go ahead and keep trying. You're trying to do marriage on your own. Go ahead and keep trying. You're trying to raise kids on your own. Go ahead and keep trying. You're a single man trying to honor God with your life. Go ahead and keep trying by yourself. You keep trying to do finances your way. You keep trying. And what ends up happening is it ends up breaking because you realize I can't. And God says, I'm going to pour out my power on all those who actually have enough faith to confess I can't. The only thing keeping you from experiencing the grace of God empowering you is your own pride. The moment you begin to say, God, I come and I have, I bring nothing to the table. I come, I need you. God says, now you're ready to be empowered. That's grace. So God's grace begins to lead us. God's grace empowers us. And the other thing I found as my research went on is that God's grace supplies all of your needs. All of your needs, all of your needs, all of your needs, all of your needs, all of your needs. Turn to two people, say all of your needs. God's grace is his goodness working to supply and provide everything that you possibly need in the middle of life. Because God is gracious, everything that he does is good. And everything he wants to bless you with is good. So Psalm 84, 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor. There's our word, grace. Hanun. He provides honor. And how does he show his grace? This is so beautiful. 
no good thing. When you picture God, do you picture him like this? No good thing does he withhold from you. No good thing. If it's good, God wants to provide it. Do you realize how gracious that is? God says, I could do whatever I want, but here's what I want to do. I want to give you every good thing you need. Every good thing. Every good thing. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk is blameless. Those who begin to trust in him, those who begin to say, God, I want to pursue you, not me. God, I'm resting in you. That means you're open to receive the very thing that God wants to pour into your life. No good thing. No good thing does he withhold from us. So in Genesis, there's an incredible statement in in Genesis 33, verse 11, Jacob is going to meet his brother Esau. And Jacob has been conniving thief his whole life. He's Jacob is that type A personality that says, I'm going to do what I need to do to get ahead. And no matter what it means, it means if if I got to lie, I'll lie. If I got to cheat, I'll cheat. It doesn't matter. I just want to get ahead. You ever know anybody like that? that? That's Jacob. So Jacob has lived his whole life fighting for himself, fighting for himself. But he realizes over and over in his life that if he fights for himself, he ends up in debt. But when he actually trusts in the Lord, he is blessed. And so he gets later on in life and he's actually going to meet Esau, his brother, which he hasn't seen for a long time. And so he comes down and he has all this this material goods. I mean, all these things. He he has children and blessing upon blessing upon blessing. And he stands before Esau and Esau says, how did you a conniving jerk? I'm reading in the Hebrew. How did you get so blessed in life? Young Jacob would have said, Woo, because I was smart, I was cunning. I went to the right school, I said the right thing, I did the right thing, I was always fighting, 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 fighting to get ahead. Young Jacob would have said that. But Jacob's been through some wars and he's been through some brokenness and he's been to Bethel, the place where he met the living God. And at the end, he says, Here's how God's been very, very, very gracious to me. I have more than enough. Jacob says, I realize that my God has been providing for me my whole entire life. And he's never let me down. This is the God that we serve, a God who wants to provide for you, a God who wants to take care of you. So David writes in Psalm 23, one, probably the most famous for the Lord is my shepherd. He's my shepherd. He's your shepherd too, but I know him personally. He's my shepherd. And I have all that I need. When God is your shepherd, you'll never have want. Because he's all you want. And if you have him, you have everything you need. He's a good, good shepherd. He's better than you could ever imagine. God says, here's how I want you to relate. I want you to think of a shepherd that is leading sheep and I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to watch over you. This is the grace of God in action. This is God moving with compassion. So we can get to Philippians 4, verse 6. The Apostle Paul, years later, is writing. He says, do not be anxious about some things. No, 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 no. Do not be anxious about... mm, I don't know what word to put here. But Paul seen the provision of God work. And so Paul says, I've learned that Do not be anxious about anything. 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 Listen, if you're not a follower of Christ, this is one of the biggest reasons I think I would at least push in to at least start trying to learn because the promise is that you can actually have a relationship that's so close to Christ that you will never be anxious ever again. That's pretty amazing. Paul says, I've come to a point in my relationship with Jesus Christ that I've learned I don't have to be anxious about everything, but in every situation, every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, I present my request to God and I allow God to hear my request whenever I feel anxiety. Listen, he's not saying I don't feel anxious. I feel anxious at times, but what do I do with my anxiety? Do I mess with my mind and I say, well, I can take care of it? Well, that's just going to fuel my anxiety. But when I feel anxious, I begin to take that anxiety and I begin to pray about it. I begin to give it to God. I begin to ask God, would you intervene in this situation where I feel so helpless in? God, would you begin to move in this situation where it feels like I'm stuck in? And God's answer is just 13 verses later, his answer is, and this is why Paul can have such incredible confidence. He says, my God, you see, this is personal, Paul. Paul says, my God, 
my God, my God, Philippians 4, 19, my God, my God, my God will meet all your needs. Well, how do we know? According to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. This is how you battle unbelief. This is how you battle anxiety. God, I'm trusting in your grace. Your grace says that you're going to supply all my needs. So I don't have to worry, God. I don't have to fret. God, you're going to provide everything that I need. How can we be so secure? How can we be, how can you be that confident that God is that gracious? Because you and I have a full revelation of grace. The full revelation of grace came in the form of Jesus Christ. We have seen Jesus and we've seen the lengths that he's going through in order to redeem us, to show us what is gracious. The reason we can know that God can provide all of our needs because he provided for our greatest needs, our own brokenness, our own sin to separate us from God. So Paul writes in Ephesians chapter two, oh, it gets good. But because of his great love for us, I love that. Because you know why? It doesn't say because of your great love for God. Because my love for God many times isn't great. But God's love for me is always great because of his great love for us, who is so rich in mercy. He made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in our transgression. What can dead people do? Come on, online. What can dead people do? If you went to a funeral and a dead person did something, <laughs> I would either start praising God, you provided a resurrection, but more than likely, I'd be running out of the place because dead people do nothing. Dead people stay dead. That's what they do. When God looks at you and says, apart from me, you can do nothing. You were dead. You see, that takes humility, doesn't it? I can't do anything to earn this. I'm dead. I'm dead in my rebellion, dead in my transgression. You are not the one who makes a move to God. God is always the one who makes a move for you. If it wasn't for God moving with his sovereign grace to begin to open your eyes and soften your heart and open your ears, you would never respond. It's always God is the one who's choosing, who's moving, who's working for our good. It's always because we're dead. So we're dead in our transgressions, dead in our brokenness. It is by grace, I love this, grace you have been saved. Well, how? Because God raised us up with Christ. Knows who's doing the work. Christ is doing the work. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him, who's him, Jesus, in the heavenly realm, in Christ Jesus. So we're now we're in Christ. So it's not me, it's now Christ who's doing all the work. So he expressed in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So God is kind to us based on Christ Jesus. So we can say, verse eight, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, not by your works so that no one can boast. No one can say, God, I deserve it. God says, no, you don't. But what makes you deserving is when you confess, I don't deserve it. See, this is the beauty of it. See, so many of you, you showed up in church and you thought, well, I know those Christians They think they got their life all together. No, no, no. What makes us a Christian is we confess we don't have our life all together. We can't do anything. We keep walking down broken paths after broken paths, but we know that one who died for us, who went to the cross for us, and on the cross, he took my sin and my shame and my guilt and my condemnation, and they put him in a grave, and they said it was over, and he said, oh, it ain't over, and he rose again on the third day, and he said, the same power that raised me, I'm not going to empower you with if you would just confess, I can't, but Jesus, I need you, I need you, I need you, I need you, I need you. This is why it says the only way you can receive grace is through faith. Romans 14, 16. For the promise of salvation depends on faith. In order that all the promises of God, this is so rich, all the promises might rest on grace. Grace means that God is moving heaven and earth to save sinners who could not lift a finger to save themselves. Grace means God sending his only son to the cross and experiencing hell itself so that we who are guilty might be reconciled to God and never have to be forsaken again. You see, that's grace. That's why God says, here's what I want you to know me by. I want you to know me as a God who is compassionate and gracious. How good is it? Oh, it's really, 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 really that good. How do you know? 
because God stepped out of heaven because he knew your name. And he knew the only one that he could bring you back into the fold to have a God as your father and your sin to be forgiven is that Jesus would have to grow and die the death you should have died upon the cross so that every sin could be forgiven and then rise again from the grave so that you can experience the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, that changes you. You're not just a sinner saved. No, 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 no. You're a saint that's been empowered by grace. You, you, you just don't walk around going, I don't know what to do. No, no, no. you got the Holy Spirit that is moving within you. By his grace, God is going to lead you to good places every single time. You have the power of God moving in your life. That's the grace of God. God is active, moving for your good in every situation. That's how good grace is. So will you pray with me? Come on. You see, you have to receive it. Have you received that grace? Just right now, will you say, God, I received the grace you have given me. God, I receive you as my God. I'm not going to lean in my own understanding anymore. I'm trusting in you, God. I'm trusting in you. And so lead me. And God, I can't do what you've called me to do. Come on, tell him. Tell him, God, I can't. So God, I pray, will you empower me by your grace? I trust in the power that is mine in Christ Jesus. God, I'm trusting in that. And then right now, would you begin to say, God, I believe, I trust that by your grace, you'll supply everything that I need. And the reason I'm confident in that is because you sent Jesus Christ who gave the greatest gift that I could have, my salvation, that my sins can be forgiven. God, supply all my needs. God, thank you for taking care of me. For God, you are good and you're worthy of my praise because God, in your all, I come fearful. You're bigger and greater than I could imagine. You are holy. But I come in wonder, bowing down before you because you're worthy of my praise. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of salvation. Thank you, God, for your grace. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.